This week we're going to talk about deploying IPv6. More specifically, we're going to talk about the planning process and the deployment itself. So as you read in your chapter readings, you have to consider two important dimensions of the discussion. The service provider versus the enterprise and greenfield versus legacy migration. Uh, internet and network service providers have a host of things to consider before they deploy IPv6 in their networks. Addressing plans, the use of the address space they've been granted, multi-tenancy, and with the need to support a much wider field of technologies across all of their customers. So with that in mind, we approach this from an enterprise viewpoint. So we'll discuss the challenges you're likely to face as you roll out IPv6 in a medium or small to medium sized company. The vast majority of IT projects involve upgrading or adding to an existing infrastructure. And it's most often true for IPv6 deployment projects as well, because almost all enterprises already have IPv4 in place. However, from starting from a clean slate or a greenfield is always simpler and easier to understand. So that's where we're going to um, start, and we're going to assume there's no legacy network. So our objectives for this week, we're going to explain the IPv6 deployment requirements and considerations. We're going to plan a deployment, including success criteria, architecture decisions, migration techniques, and the tasks that you'll have to complete. And we're going to deploy IPv6 by establishing a test or pilot network. We're going to migrate applications, upgrade v4 only hosts to v4 v6, uh, add a tunneled v6 environment using 6 to 4 Teredo or Isotap. So, uh, in looking at IPv6 deployments, um, the key point is that. They use a new network layer or routed protocol. So to humans, the V6 protocol may appear to be just an upgrade or a new version of V4, but to the applications themselves, it's quite different. Um, V6 deployments use a new network layer routed protocol, as I said, and the reason that this is an issue is the way software accesses the network, that needs to be updated. Network layer protocol functionality on hosts is mostly deployed as software uh, in the form of drivers and occasionally deployed as firmware, um, either if you have uh, IoT devices or routers or application-specific integrated circuits or ASICs in the network interface controllers. Uh, new versions of all that software had to be written to support IPv6, so not just upgrades to old code. And also remember that ICMP is a specialized part of IP and not a separate entity. So we're not looking at a separate protocol, but a subset of a large multifaceted protocol, uh, one that internet and ethernet lands could not exist without. So when we're planning an IPv6 deployment, two key factors when deploying uh, v6 are success criteria. So that's a list of conditions used to define whether an activity or task was completed successfully or not and architectural decisions. We look at protocol, hardware, tools, and so on and so forth. So in establishing your success criteria, you have to ask, just like any software or hardware project, why are you doing this in the first place? What's the return on investment? Um, what's the impact to the business? And how you answer this question usually has a big impact on how and what you deploy. Are you going to deploy everything? Are you going to deploy partially? Um, again, this isn't just specific really to IP projects or upgrades to IPv6, but in general, if, if you're doing a technical project, you need to consider what you're going to be deploying and what success looks like. The reason for deploying v6 may determine your due dates and your project funding. So I talked about return on investment. What's the impact to the business? Is there a driver for this deployment? Um, do you, how do you make this transparent to users? Uh, is there a requirement for doing the deployment? And your test procedures and the new functionality you choose will be based off of that. There's usually many ways to accomplish a task and some are better than others. And whichever you choose, you need to document, communicate, and deploy them consistently. So you're going to have to make a bunch of architectural decisions regarding the following items. Your interior gateway protocol or IGP your exterior gateway protocol, or EGP, your external connections, your router hardware and software selection, 
addressing schemes, stateful versus stateless autoconfig, QoS, security, tools, and other network hardware such as firewalls and load balancers and so on and so forth. So let's start from the beginning of the list, your IGP. You're going to have to convey reachability information about all those IPv6 addresses between routers on your network. Now there's many standard and proprietary, so non-standards based, geared towards a particular company, etc. Options for routing v6, such as Open Shortest Path Fast Firth, First v3, so OSPF v3, uh, EIGRP, so Enhanced Interior Gateway Protocol for IPv6. And then you also have to consider a bunch of other factors uh, in determining what routing protocol. You have the size of the environment, uh, your distance between uh, sites, anticipated size of the routing table, and the, the rate of change in the routing table, uh, convergence times, uh, quote-unquote tweakability. Uh, how, what is the configurability uh, of what you're installing? The skill set of the engineers and the staff that you have or that you have access to through an external third party, either through staff augmentation or contracting. Um, M&A activity, so is your company going to acquire another company or will you be acquired? You're gonna to have to merge those two networks. What does that look like in the future? Legacy compatibility and future development, so looking back to the past and looking to the future. And what vendors do you support today uh, in terms of hardware and software and what do you look to support in the future? So now to your exterior gateway protocol, uh, the most commonly used EGP is BGP, so the border gateway protocol, and you need to consider whether to also implement in inside your network between sites. So BGP has a reserve range of autonomous system numbers, or ASNs, for private use that work much like the so-called private addresses described in uh, RFC 1918. Now these are private and semi-private ASNs that are only unique inside your network. Assigning each site as a private ASN and using BGP on a WAN is a common practice that limits the IGP to the LAN at each individual site. And usually that has two advantages. It allows you to limit the failure domain so you control the redistribution and injection of routes between IGP and EGP and it tends to optimize your convergence times because IGPs are very fast, but they don't scale well. BGP scales much faster, but it uh, converges slower. So now to external connections. So external connections are substantially similar to V4 from a connectivity and security perspective. What's changed is that you don't need a NAT. A related change is the potential size of the global internet routing table. So that's referred to as the BGP table, the internet routing table, or the global BGP. The challenge comes when organizations want to multi-home their networks. When you multi-home, you may need to apply for your own address space directly from the regional authority instead of giving a portion of your ISP's address space. And then another consideration is how you'll handle mobility. In this context, mobility is the ability to move geographically, so untethered by physical network cables or power cables. And in V6, mobility is the ability to move from one network to another network while retaining an IP address for ongoing sessions. Next, you have to select the router hardware and software. Selecting a router vendor for a V6 network is a substantially similar process to selecting one for a V4 network, and almost all router vendors support V6. However, you need to get details about the extent of V6 support in the products because many vendors have implemented only basic mandatory functions. And you have to thoroughly test your plans in a lab with the exact version of software you plan to use because it might run into bugs or interoperability issues. In terms of address schemes, unlike v4 address schemes, you don't need to perform IP subnetting in v6 because each subnet can support an extremely large number of hosts. Most of the thought put into addressing schemes will be directed towards creating a hierarchy in the network portion of the address that's useful in identifying ownership, location, so on and so forth. Otherwise, you want to take into account uh, a few additional factors. So the ability to easily summarize subnets, the ability to easily construct firewall rules and access lists, and the ability to easily identify by function or location. And when we talk about stateful versus stateless auto configuration, one challenge is telling a diverse group 
from servers to mobile phones to kiosks what their network address is and how to get off the local subnet and to the internet. So that is the address of their default gateway. Another challenge is assigning parameters such as their domain name. Uh, IPv6 offers two dynamic options, stateful and stateless address autoconfig, in addition to the manual static option. So when should you use DHCPv6? When you need to control over the environment, such as uh, if you want to require authentication to access the network, or when you want to share more information than just the minimum needed for routing. So for example, a stateless autoconfig doesn't tell the client its domain name and it won't update a dynamic DNS system. And you can also use a combination of Slack and DHCPv6, so uh, stateful and stateless, known as stateless DHCPv6. And we talk about quality of service, so QoS in, in v6 is basically the same as diffserve in v4 as far as decisions about marking and scheduling of packets are concerned. But there's two big differences. Packets in v6 can be very large. So, uh, when we talk about jumbograms, and the fragmentation is done by the hosts, not the intermediaries, so not the routers. Therefore, the potential exists for uh, much greater jitter. And v6 includes a flow label, which is the portion of the v6 header that's used for QoS. Uh, when we talk about security, um, we've talked about security in other places, and v6, unlike v4, has a lot of security baked in. Um, but you have to have a few security-related discussions. How are you going to secure your network protocols? What are you encrypting? What in-motion encryption is important? And uh, do you have no perimeter? So uh, when we talk about tools, some tools that support v6 are the latest versions of PuTTY, uh, TerraTerm, TFPD32, FTPD32, so your TFTP daemon 32-bit uh, dig. Um, you have SNMP tools, so what's up. Um, in addition, uh, you can use Nmap and other scanners. You have to gather all these tools for your deployment and figure out what you need to use and when you need to use it. And the techniques for managing devices in an IPv6 network are likely to change substantially. So you have to uh, do the tooling, you have to look at uh, what tools you need and when. When we talk about other network hardware, uh, potential strategies um, include changing to a similar product from another vendor that supports v6, leaving the network device on v4 and translating or tunneling to the rest of your network, and continuing to run a dual protocol v4 and v6 network until all legacy devices have been upgraded or replaced. So when we look at migration and uh, transitioning techniques, um, there's uh, three categories, tunneling, translation, and dual stack. And we're gonna talk about when you should use a given technique and why. So there's, there's many tunneling techniques, each of which involves embedding or encapsulating one protocol inside another for transport. The primary types of V6 tunnels that we've talked about in previous videos and you've read about in previous chapters are 6 to 4, Isotap, and Teredo. Generally, the translation group includes techniques that involve a middleman or intermediary that speaks both V4 and V6 and converts them or translates between them. So here is, uh, well, if we jump a couple slides ahead, um, this is a, an example of how a, a basic translation would work. I'm kind of jumping back. When we talk about tunneling, here's an example of a tunnel configured between two routers and two hosts trying to talk to each other. So we look at dual stack again. Uh, the clear front runner for most uh, IP... Uh, v4 and v6 transition is dual stack. It's possible to use DNS uh, to make applications prefer v6, um, but you can combine the techniques and you can do a phased migration. Um, so when we talk about dual stack, we'll flip to uh, this diagram. Here's an example of dual stack where you have both IPv4 and IPv6 devices on a network and again, when you look at dual stack, you have to break up your migra migration by device and by the phases that you define. 
All right, so let's jump into the various tasks. So number one, you have to inventory your computers and your network infrastructure elements. Some organizations, particularly those with mature security and IT processes, and those that follow an IT services management framework like ITIL, so the Information Technology Infrastructure Library, may already have an up-to-date inventory of all the devices attached to the network. Now, whether you're starting the inventory from scratch or already have the devices listed, you need to collect the following information about each one. Your device identifiers, such as the product name, serial number, location, etc. The owner of the device and their contact information. Any information about whether the device is considered mission critical or if an outage associated with the device would be classified according to a severity level, such as SEV1 or SEV2. Availability of the device, for example, is it only used during business hours, 8 to 5, or does it have a weekly maintenance window on Saturday nights at midnight? What switch, slot, and port is the device connected to? Is the device, uh, does it have a current IPv4 address and VLAN, and whether it received the IP address statically via DHCP or another method? If the device requires anything unusual, like multicast, whether the device's model supports v6 and specific issues like interoperability or constraints on the number of addresses it supports what version of software or firmware the device is running and whether it will need to be upgraded whether the device is under a maintenance contract from the manufacturer and if so how do you get support for it what management on the network uh, sorry what network management devices monitor it that might need to be updated as well when we talk about inventorying applications, one challenge in inventorying applications is simply identifying what constitutes an application. On one extreme, an operating system like Windows is made of hundreds of components running as services, and many of them might require attention. On the other extreme, a single application might be scaled across many physical servers. In any event, the, a great deal of thought should precede that activity. When we look at acquiring IPv6 addresses, after you make the decision about whether to multi-home or not, you will need to acquire some IPv6 addresses. You usually receive addresses as a block from your regional service provider. If you choose to multi-home, you'll have to go to a regional internet registry to get a block assigned to you. You must first demonstrate that your organization meets the qualifications. Blocks of IPv6 addresses are not issued to anyone who simply requests them. Next, you have to work with providers. So assuming you have a legacy WAN and you're satisfi satisfied with your current service provider's pricing and service, the easiest and least expensive course of action would be to run IPv6 over the same circuits. It would generally be a bad idea to attempt to tie a migration from one service provider to another to the migration from V4 to V6. And during migration, you go through a period during which you have circuits from both vendors connected to your site so the cost of your network is doubled. Make sure you understand what capabilities of your service provider are for v6. Uh, discuss the way they do quality of service and their pricing structure for different classes of service and service levels. And ask if they offer any support or services for the transition, like managing translation servers or tunnel brokers. You have to remediate your software and servers. So while this task is critical, it's not one the network team usually performs. The server and the application deployment teams normally update the software for IPv6. The network team needs to provide some information and education about the new network, though. It's a good idea to prepare a presentation explaining how things have changed. So, for example, if the server team believes it should always use static addresses on servers for reliability, you may have to educate that team on how each interface on a server will have several addresses and how they configure themselves in IPv6. The actual task of remediating software is going to be the critical path for most projects, and it's going to determine how long you have to maintain dual stack, tunnels, or translation services. Next, you want to create a test lab. A test lab is critical for v6 for several reasons. Number one, you need to uh, have a sandbox, an IT environment isolated from the production environment to test the network devices to ensure functionality and interoperability and identify any bugs. And the application developers and other administrators will need to place a test uh, on their applications, various models of hosts they remediate and upgrade them to be IPv6 native. When you build the lab, 
consider that you will likely want to use it as a, to test different techniques across multiple phases of the migration. And here's an example of a test lab setup. Next, you want to update your routers. Now, this task is going to be one of the core components of the transition. You'll probably update each router multiple times as you initially enable IPv6 routing and later add and remove various tunnels. Before each step, take care not to exceed the CPU's capacity, memory, or the throughput on those boxes. Remember that some processes may be handled in hardware A6 for IPv4, such as processing access lists. They might be handled in software for v6, so that could substantially increase the load on the CPU and dramatically reduce performance. You're going to want to update virtual network devices. So uh, in today's environments, the network, quote unquote, it actually extends well into the server. And most server-based hypervisors, there's one or more virtual switches or bridges that have to act like a real switch in that they participate in spanning tree, have virtual ports that connect the software to virtual NICs on virtual machines, etc., etc. Although these virtual network entities are usually layer two only, that's not always the case. Regardless, you need to test them to ensure that they can handle v6 features from multicast to jumbo frames. Now you have to update your DNS. You'll likely accomplish this by upgrading your DNS server software to a version that supports v6 and then adding the 4A records and the pointer records for reverse lookups. If you use DDNS, so dynamic DNS, or if you choose to perform a migration via the order of A and 4A records in DNS, the task will become considerably more complex and the coordination more critical. Either way, you should consider uh, researching the alternatives for commercial and free DNS servers and consider the location of the server and the physical computer it's running on. You're going to have to update to DHCV fix, uh, v6, and this is optional. Uh, updating um, this, uh, I mean, since devices can auto configure, you don't need to, but if you're going to implement v6 to get around the limitations of auto configuration, then a planning is going to be similar to DNS. Uh, you should research and evaluate DHCP v6 servers and what features they support. Uh, going live with a new DHCP v6 server takes more finesse as the new server won't know what IP addresses already have been leased out. So you can get IP address conflicts. And usually this is done by reducing the DHCP v6 release, or sorry, lease time before the migration to an hour or so. That way when you, when you do a cutover in a two to three hour change window, all the clients would have asked for new leases during that window. And then you can set the lease time back to normal. And then you're going to want to look uh, to update your tools. So you'll, you'll likely want to use protocol analyzers, monitors, uh, SLA managers, CMDBs, out-of-band gateways and terminal servers, IP address management, and doing the transition. So now we're going to look at deploying and using uh, IPv6. We're going to take a detailed look at a few of the common tasks involved in deploying IPv6. For most of the tasks, we're going to focus on how to accomplish the task technically, um, looking at one or more commercial or freeware products. So first, we have to establish an IPv6 test pile in our network. So establishing the network's one of your first tasks, best practices to use the same make and model of routers and switches in the lab that we use in production. But part of the purpose of a test lab is to evaluate and test devices. So uh, functions you'll want to look in the lab. Again, a way to get to the lab, how to inject routes, a WAN and traffic simulator, a sniffer and protocol analyzer, instances of each server type, and a configuration repository. And then you're going to have three main phases uh, in the test lab. First, you're going to evaluate, so look at the brands, uh, try them out. Then you're going to reconfigure the lab to use the exact models you want to use for deployment. And then you're going to use those exact models to test the servers and applications that are required for deployment using um, those same SKUs that you will be uh, deploying out. When we look at uh, migrating applications, 
Once your lab is up and running um, with an IPv6 enabled network and servers, your application clients can start bridging in their software to test. So uh, when you're looking at the tasks required for this activity, keep in mind that coding is beyond the scope of what you're doing in your network role. That is going to be other teams, but you're going to have to work with them to talk about the differences in the environment. And make sure that everybody tracks the changes they make to the infrastructure just as you're tracking the changes you're making to the environment. So when you're upgrading v4 only host to v4 or v6, you have to consider how you're going to make the change consistently on similar devices. You're going to use a CLI or a GUI. Um, and although there's um, uh, hundreds of brands and types of hosts that you'll need to upgrade, um, you know, and one of the easier examples is looking at Windows PCs. Because the individual commands and syntax interfaces vary greatly by operating system and function, um, it's tough to memorize them, but you should focus on understanding the general commands to achieve the functionality you want. You're going to have to look at each interface um, that receives an IPv6 link local address and, and possibly others, and look at the default settings, including privacy. So here's an example going back to Windows using the NetShell interface IPv6 show address command, one of the tools you will use. And here's the results of running that command. For show interfaces. And this is the show global command. And here's the show privacy command. So again, if you need if you need to change the policy table that controls the order of selection, create configuration files, and ultimately the commands, the config files can be put in a script that you can run on similar hosts. And here's another example of IP of the uh, nutshell show prefix policies and the IPv6 dump command. All right, so now we're going to look at creating an IP or a tunneled IPv6 environment using 6 to 4. So um, again, going to Windows. So uh, you, if you've configured um, the NetShell interface, IPv6, add v6 v4 tunnel command, there's three parameters you're going to use, the tunnel name, the address of the local end of the tunnel, and the address of the remote end of the tunnel. If you're going to configure an ISOTAP router, uh, you'll need a dual stack box capable of uh, forwarding traffic. You have to enable ISOTAP um, by entering the command netshell interface IPv6. ISOTAP set router and then uh, the IP address in that router and then you're going to have to enable forward traffic uh, with the uh, command in the NetShell interface IPv6 set interface um, with forwarding enabled and advertising enabled and you're going to have to add the routes that you want the router to advertise and here's an example of uh, an ISOTAP tunnel environment Also remember you have to add a name record for isotap to DNS. So you'll add an entry in the Etsy host file for isotap and skip the DNS config step. And for Windows still using NetBIOS, you have to put the entry into WINS. And if you use DNS, add the A record, not the 4A record for host name uh, for, uh, for the host name of the isotap in your domain that points to the IPv4 address of the router. And then you're going to run the DNS command uh, with the options config and global uh, query block list with your WPAD file. <clears throat> Finally, you have to configure ISOTAP on the client. So you're going to have to tell the client the ISOTAP router address using NetShell interface IPv6 ISOTAP set router with the IP address of the router. So we're going to explore some network administration tasks. Um, 
So when you look at routing tables, you're going to use the NetShell interface IPv6 show route command. When you want to look at multicast addresses, you want to look at NetShell interface IPv6 show joins. Um, you can test connectivity by pinging IPv6 addresses. And uh, for DHCP, IP config uh, WAC release 6 and IPv, IP config WAC renew 6. So normally in IPv4, you would use IP config WAC release and WAC renew. Uh, you just add a 6 on there for IPv6 uh, if you're looking to renew uh, and release your DHCP leases. So here are the results, for instance, if we run the show route command. Here are the show joins command that we discussed. And here's running ping. All right, so this week we talked about IPv6 deployments. Um, they use a network layer or routed protocol differently than v4 deployments do. The network layer protocol functionality on hosts is mostly deployed to software. IPv4 software is mature and most v4 drivers are relatively defect free, but that's not true of v6. v6 deployment planning includes the creation of success criteria and architectural decisions. And these decisions include IGP, EGP, external connections, router, hardware, and software selection, and so on. Migration techniques include tunneling, translation, dual stack, or a combination of techniques, so a phased migration. You should create a checklist of tasks to accomplish during your deployment, and it's important to establish a v6 test lab or pilot network before deploying IPv6.